Now on BBC Radio 4, there's another chance to hear a programme about the classic folk album Bright Phoebus, which has been called the Sergeant Pepper of the folk world. It's presented by the music journalist Peter Fafidis and was originally part of the Lost Album series. The programme is in memory of the folk musician Mike Watterson, who died in June. It was pure sixties. <laughs> Daydream, psychedelic in some ways. It was an awareness of another world that wasn't grey. Sometimes it's a fantasy world, sometimes it's a deeply poetic world, sometimes it's an idealised world. It was quite a mysterious album in a lot of ways for me because it wasn't as immediate as the music that was around all the time, you know, the music that they sang all the time in the house. I suppose you could even make a comparison with Dylan going electric at Newport Festival in the mid-60s. It did cause massive ripples, waves even, on the smooth surface of the traditional music scene in this country. The record in question is Bright Phoebus by Lal and Mike Waterson, a record that mapped out all sorts of new possibilities for the English folk song. Twelve postcards from a world where beauty and hardship are intertwined. When it appeared in 1972, Lal and Mike were known for their work alongside their sister Norma and John Harrison in The Watersons. They were folk singers in the 60s, a decade which saw an explosion of interest in traditional British music. Mike Waterson. We were brought up by Grandma a generation back where we didn't listen to the radio, we didn't have a TV, we sat round the fire and we sang. If my father and mother had lived, we'd have probably been into jazz because my dad was a great jazz fan. Grandma wasn't. Grandma was into music hall and hymns and one or two of them were folk songs, you know. For it's sun, oh sun, what have you done? You're bound for Bogney Bay. I was born. We used to have poetry and we were given a poem, 64 kids and you had to come back the next week and know it and it was a shilling for the ones who could remember it well guess what I got the coin week after week after week <laughs> Oh the broom the bonny bonny broom the broom of golden love. By the time of their first visit to London the Watersons had already attracted the attention of Topic Records in-house producer Bill Leader Inside of eight months, we were professional singers. And it was not what we wanted. What did you want? We wanted to sing. <laughs> There's a subtle difference. A real difference. You're travelling hundreds of miles, and whether you felt good, bad or indifferent, you stand up on a stage and turn it on. Once I was a For Lal and Mike Waterson, both of whom who had started families by the mid-60s, fame came as something of a shock. Martin Carthy had been a regular visitor to their Folk Union One club nights in Hull. They were absolutely worn out, and the final straw was doing, I think it was at Queen's University, Belfast. Started at 8 o'clock, they did a half an hour, and they introduced singer after singer after singer after singer after singer. They finally got off the stage at about five o'clock in the morning and they went back to where they were sleeping and they sat on their bed and they stared at each other and they said, we've had enough, no more, that's it. For the first time in their lives, the Watersons went their separate ways. Norma accepted an offer to become a DJ on the island of Montserrat. John Harrison moved south to study fiddle. Lal married her husband George and moved to Leeds leaving Mike in Hull with his new guitar. Lo and behold, Lal and George came back to Hull and Lal says, what do you think of this? I've been writing these songs. And I said, snap, what do you think of these? I've been writing these songs. And it was because we were missing singing. In this kind of period where, I guess it's kind of like a period of limbo in a way, what were your lives like at that point in time? Well, Lal was a housewife with a couple of children and I'd go to work 
as a painter and decorator and, and do a bit of genre work or a bit of bricking or a bit of plastering or whatever, you know. Lal lived in the avenues in Hull. Every dinner time, I went round to her house for an hour and we wrote songs. And then a wee, what do you think of this? And he said, it's great, that's wonderful, is that? Just needs tidying up, she said. And you'd go back the following week and there was another wonderful tune and she'd dump the old one. When if a rod was born on one cold May morning in June in a grandmother's bedroom and they waited all that day By 1970, Martin Carthy had also fancied a change. He swapped his acoustic guitar for an electric one and went on tour with a brand new band, Steel Ice Band. I think we did Hull Art School or something and went round the next morning to visit Lau and she had all these songs. And some of them, we just had these extraordinary words. She writes in a very organic, very animal way, but her style is quite distinct from folk music. And she always had a really astonishing harmonic sense so that when I actually sat down with her to try and find out what she was getting at harmonically, we'd spend, you know, like two hours on one song while I sort of tried something and said, how's that? And she said, it's very nice. Is that what you want? No. <laughs> you know, so try something else and gradually sort of inch your way to the end of the song. And she waited for death to come and her of war, but he never came. The folk world at that time was quite an interesting place. It was just before the whole thing imploded. Things hadn't become too self-satisfied. Life was still pretty vibrant. There were a lot of clubs. What was actually happening was that the music was changing because it was now in a new setting. In the early 70s, folk could no longer be contained by the narrow definition set out by the 60s folk revival. Fairport Convention and Steel Ice Band helped bring folk rock to the commercial forefront of British music, while artists like Pentangle and Incredible String Band offered daring arrangements of traditional and self-written songs, which blew open the parameters of what might be considered a folk song. These were artists in step with the prevailing spirit of experimentation who had a sitar and weren't afraid to use it. A schism had opened up between purists and the new crop of musicians. As innovative as their approach might have seemed back in the mid-60s, the Watersons had become emblematic of the old ways. If they ever got back together, original self-written material would have been the last thing their fans expected of them. It was the time, you know, when the Beatles were off in India. I'd already ten years before read Levi's Transcendental Magic, you know. It was in the library, you read it, relaxing and yoga and stuff like that. It was all just so much rhubarb to me. But obviously it rubs off. And you wanted an alternative to what was going on. Having left Fairport Convention in 1970, Ashley Tiger Hutchings found himself alongside Martin Carthy in Steel Ice Band. When Martin played him the songs, Ashley's reaction was immediate. I was instantly in tune with them. I found an empathy with them and, you know, I really would have fought off anyone <laughs> to play the bass on those uh, songs as I did. Martin Carthy. Ashley is a doer. And as soon as he heard him, he said, right, I'm going to get all the Fairport lads together and we're going to do this. Just one question remained. Where to record these songs? Now running his own record company, Trailer, Bill Leader, the man who had first signed the Watersons, suggested Cecil Sharp House headquarters of the English Folk Dance and Song Society in leafy North London. The studio, as such as it was, had to be built by Bill Leader. You know, mics and baffles and everything had to be carefully placed because it wasn't a recording studio. As I rolled out one summer's morn 
I saw a scarecrow tied to a pole. So you're in Cecil Sharp House with these songs, and it's kind of interesting in a way because Cecil Sharp House is the absolute sort of bastion of doing things traditionally and kind of doing other people's songs in a way. And you came in with these songs that, that you and your sister had written. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. <laughs> They're a part and parcel of the tradition. I mean, Scarecrow was wonderful. I would you lay me down and love me. I would you lay me down and love me if you could. Or oh, you're only a bang of the rams in an overall. That the wind Way, so the crows fly away and the corn can grow tall. We were They're reading at the time, we'd just bought the full set of the early folk song journals. I think it's uh, Hugh of Lincoln, or round about there, was a thing talking about jelly dons. Those parts were lifted. <laughs> I saw twelve jolly dons dressed I mean, you get twelve jolly dons dressed out in the blue and the gold together. It was symbolism. And to a stake they tied a child newborn. Lal wrote two verses to that. And she said, where does it go now? And I hung the child on the stake. That was my verse. It's the dark, it's dark stuff, isn't it? I know that sacrificial stuff went on in the early days. Now you can lay me down and love me if you will Or you're only a bang of ranks in an overall I brought it along just because I just thought maybe it might even jog a couple of memories. In my supermarket bag, here it is, Bright Phoebus. So looking yes. at that, we've got this picture of this kind of... It's like a pagan sun almost, isn't it? It is, a, you know, it's, it's exactly that. Yeah. You wrote the title track, Bright Phoebus. Can you remember what was happening in your life? <laughs> yeah. The lad I worked with was called Brian, and he said, how do you write a song? And I was painting a window, a big Victorian window, and I said, I don't know, it's like, you know, the sun shone through, literally, from the clouds. And I said, it's like, today, Bright Phoebus, she shot, and he said... <laughs> What do you mean? And I had to explain what Phoebus was. And I carried on with the verse. I then says, you'll have to excuse me. And uh, put my stuff down. I went round to Lala's and picked a guitar up and got the chords quick before I forgot. And then I went back to work again. You know, <laughs> docked an hour off my time. Today bright Phoebus, she smiled down on me for the very first time. On the very first time she smiled on me Contemporary folk singer and fiddle player Eliza Carthy, daughter of Norma Watson and Martin Carthy, remembers listening to Bright Phoebus as a child. I always loved rubber band now, so it was very, very silly. I'm not quite sure about Just Like Margarine, our famous spreading. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that. <laughs> Just like Margarine, our famous spreading. And our eyes were start on all this love. Obviously, my favourite bit when I was a kid was the rubber band solo in the middle as well, the boingy bit. <laughs> it got you started, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, my famous rubber band career. <laughs> Ashley Hutching. To a certain extent, they felt out of their depth. They'd not worked with electric guitars and drums and so forth. 